Section 25 of A Collection of Supreme Court Opinions by the United States Supreme Court. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Roe v. Wade, 410 U.S. 113, decided January 2, 1973. Part 1. Please note, this is a reading of the opinion of the court only. This reading does not include the syllabus or any concurring or dissenting opinions. For ease of listening, this reading omits legal citations found within the text of the court's opinion. Mr. Justice Blackman delivered the opinion of the court. This Texas federal appeal and its Georgia companion, Doe v. Bolton, post, present constitutional challenges to state criminal abortion legislation. The Texas statutes under attack here are typical of those that have been in effect in many states for approximately a century. The Georgia statutes, in contrast, have a modern cast and are a legislative product that, to an extent at least, obviously reflects the influences of recent attitudinal change, of advancing medical knowledge and techniques, and of new thinking about an old issue. We forthwith acknowledge our awareness of the sensitive and emotional nature of the abortion controversy, of the vigorous opposing views even among physicians, and of the deep and seemingly absolute convictions that the subject inspires. One's philosophy, one's experiences, one's exposure to the raw edges of human existence, one's religious training, one's attitudes toward life and family and their values, and the moral standards one establishes and seeks to observe are all likely to influence and to color one's thinking and conclusions about abortion. In addition, population growth, pollution, poverty, and racial overtones tend to complicate and not to simplify the problem. Our task, of course, is to resolve the issue by constitutional measurement, free of emotion and of predilection. We seek earnestly to do this, and because we do, we have inquired into and in this opinion place some emphasis upon medical and medical legal history, and what that history reveals about man's attitudes toward the abortion procedure over the centuries. We bear in mind, too, Mr. Justice Holmes' admonition in his now vindicated dissent in Lochner v. New York. Quote, The Constitution is made for people of fundamentally differing views, and the accident of our finding certain opinions natural and familiar or novel and even shocking ought not to conclude our judgment upon the question whether statutes embodying them conflict with the Constitution of the United States. End of quote. The Texas statutes that concern us here are Articles 1191 through 1194 and 1196 of the state's penal code. Footnote. Article 1191. Abortion. If any person shall designedly administer to a pregnant woman, or knowingly procure to be administered with her consent any drug or medicine, or shall use towards her any violence or means whatever externally or internally applied, and thereby procure an abortion, he shall be confined in the penitentiary not less than two, nor more than five years. If it be done without her consent, the punishment shall be doubled. By abortion is meant that the life of the fetus or embryo shall be destroyed in the woman's womb, or that a premature birth thereof be caused. Article 1192. Furnishing the means. Whoever furnishes the means for procuring an abortion, knowing the purpose intended, is guilty as an accomplice. Article 1193. Attempt at abortion. If the means used shall fail to produce an abortion, the offender is nevertheless guilty of an attempt to produce abortion, provided it be shown that such means were calculated to produce that result and shall be fined not less than one hundred, nor more than one thousand dollars. Article 1194. Murder in producing abortion. If the death of the mother is occasioned by an abortion so produced, or by an attempt to effect the same, it is murder. Article 1196. Nothing in this chapter applies to an abortion procured or attempted by medical advice for the purpose of saving the life of the mother. The foregoing articles, together with Article 1195, compose Chapter 9 of Title 15 of the Penal Code. Article 1195, not attacked here, reads, Article 1195, Destroying Unborn Child. 
whoever shall during parturition of the mother destroy the vitality or life in a child in a state of being born and before actual birth which child would otherwise have been born alive shall be confined in the penitentiary for life or for not less than five years end of footnote these make it a crime to quote, procure an abortion end of quote as therein defined or to attempt one except with respect to quote, an abortion procured or attempted by medical advice for the purpose of saving the life of the mother end of quote similar statutes are in existence in a majority of the states texas first enacted a criminal abortion statute in 1854 this was soon modified into language that has remained substantially unchanged to the present time the final article in each of these compilations provided the same exception as does the present article 1196 for an abortion by quote, medical advice for the purpose of saving the life of the mother end of quote footnote Long ago, a suggestion was made that the Texas statutes were unconstitutionally vague because of definitional deficiencies. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals disposed of that suggestion peremptorily, saying only, quote, It is also insisted in the motion in arrest of judgment that the statute is unconstitutional and void, in that it does not sufficiently define or describe the offense of abortion. We do not concur in respect to this question. End of quote. The same court recently has held again that the state's abortion statutes are not unconstitutionally vague or overbroad. The court held that, quote, the state of Texas has a compelling interest to protect fetal life, end of quote. That Article 1191, quote, is designed to protect fetal life, end of quote. That the Texas homicide statutes, particularly Article 1205 of the Penal Code, are intended to protect a person, quote, in existence by actual birth, end of quote, and thereby implicitly recognize other human life that is not, quote, in existence by actual birth, end of quote. That the definition of human life is for the legislature and not the courts. That Article 1196, quote, is more definite than the District of Columbia statute upheld in United States versus Village, end of quote and that the Texas statute, quote, is not vague and indefinite or overbroad, end of quote. A physician's abortion conviction was affirmed. In Thompson, the court observed that any issue as to the burden of proof under the exemption of Article 1196, quote, is not before us, end of quote. End of footnote. Two, Jane Rowe, footnote, the name is a pseudonym, end of footnote. A single woman who was residing in Dallas County, Texas, instituted this federal action in March 1970 against the district attorney of the county. She sought a declaratory judgment that the Texas criminal abortion statutes were unconstitutional on their face and an injunction restraining the defendant from enforcing the statutes. Roe alleged that she was unmarried and pregnant that she wished to terminate her pregnancy by an abortion, quote, performed by a competent licensed physician under safe clinical conditions, end of quote, that she was unable to get a legal abortion in Texas because her life did not appear to be threatened by the continuation of her pregnancy, and that she could not afford to travel to another jurisdiction in order to secure a legal abortion under safe conditions. She claimed that the Texas statutes were unconstitutionally vague and that they abridged her right of personal privacy, protected by the 1st, 4th, 5th, ninth, and 14th Amendments. By an amendment to her complaint, Roe purported to sue, quote, on behalf of herself and all other women, end of quote, similarly situated. James Hubert Halford, a licensed physician, sought and was granted leave to intervene in Roe's action. In his complaint, he alleged that he had been arrested previously for violations of the Texas abortion statutes, and that two such prosecutions were pending against him. He described conditions of patients who came to him seeking abortions, and he claimed that for many cases he, as a physician, was unable to determine whether they fell within or outside the exception recognized by Article 1196. He alleged that, as a consequence, the statutes were vague and uncertain, in violation of the 14th Amendment, and that they violated his own and his patient's rights to privacy in the doctor-patient relationship, and his own right to practice medicine, rights he claimed were guaranteed by the 1st, 4th, 5th, ninth, and 14th Amendments. 
John and Mary Doe, footnote, these names are pseudonyms, end of footnote, a married couple, filed a companion complaint to that of Roe. They also named the district attorney as defendant, claimed like constitutional deprivations, and sought declaratory and injunctive relief. The Doe's alleged that they were a childless couple, that Mrs. Doe was suffering from a, quote, neurochemical, end of quote, disorder, that her physician had, quote, advised her to avoid pregnancy until such time as her condition was materially improved, end of quote, although a pregnancy at the present time would not present, quote, a serious risk, end of quote, to her life, that pursuant to medical advice, she had discontinued use of birth control pills, and that if she should become pregnant, she would want to terminate the pregnancy by an abortion performed by a competent licensed physician under safe clinical conditions. By an amendment to their complaint, the Doe's purported to sue, quote, on behalf of themselves and all couples similarly situated, end of quote. The two actions were consolidated and heard together by a duly convened three-judge district court. The suits thus presented the situations of the pregnant single woman, the childless couple, with the wife not pregnant, and the licensed practicing physician, all joining in the attack on the Texas criminal abortion statutes. Upon the filing of affidavits, motions were made for dismissal and for summary judgment. The court held that Roe and members of her class and Dr. Halford had standing to sue and presented justiciable controversies, but that the Doe's had failed to allege facts sufficient to state a present controversy and did not have standing. It concluded that, with respect to the request for a declaratory judgment, abstention was not warranted. On the merits, the district court held that the, quote, fundamental right of single women and married persons to choose whether to have children is protected by the Ninth Amendment through the Fourteenth Amendment, end of quote, and that the Texas criminal abortion statutes were void on their face because they were both unconstitutionally vague and constituted an overbroad infringement of the plaintiff's Ninth Amendment rights. The court then held that abstention was warranted with respect to the request for an injunction. It therefore dismissed the Doe's complaint, declared the abortion statutes void, and dismissed the application for injunctive relief. The plaintiffs Roe and Doe and the intervener Halford, pursuant to 28 U.S.C. Section 1253, have appealed to this court from that part of the district court's judgment denying the injunction. The defendant district attorney has purported to cross appeal, pursuant to the same statute, from the court's grant of declaratory relief to Roe and Halford. Both sides also have taken protective appeals to the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. That court ordered the appeals held in abeyance pending decision here. We postponed decision on jurisdiction to the hearing on the merits. It might have been preferable if the defendant, pursuant to our Rule 20, had presented to us a petition for certiori before judgment in the Court of Appeals with respect to the granting of the plaintiff's prayer for declaratory relief. Our decisions in Mitchell v. Donovan and Gunn v. University Committee are to the effect that Section 1253 does not authorize an appeal to this Court from the grant or denial of declaratory relief alone. We conclude, nevertheless, that those decisions do not foreclose our review of both the injunctive and the declaratory aspects of a case of this kind, when it is properly here, as this one is, on appeal under 1253 from specific denial of injunctive relief, and the arguments as to both aspects are necessarily identical. It would be destructive of time and energy for all concerned were we to rule otherwise. 4. We are next confronted with issues of judiciability, standing, and abstention. Have Roe and the Doe's established that Quote, personal stake in the outcome of the controversy, end of quote, that ensures that, quote, the dispute sought to be adjudicated will be presented in an adversary context and in a form historically viewed as capable of judicial resolution, end of quote. And what effect did the pendency of criminal abortion charges against Dr. Halford in state court have upon the propriety of the federal courts granting relief to him as a plaintiff intervener? A. Jane Roe. Despite the use of the pseudonym, no suggestion is made that Roe is a fictitious person. 
For purposes of her case, we accept as true and as established her existence, her pregnant state as of the inception of her suit in March 1970, and as late as May 21st of that year, when she filed an alias affidavit with the district court, and her inability to obtain a legal abortion in Texas. Viewing Roe's case as of the time of its filing, and thereafter until as late as May, there can be little dispute that it then presented a case or controversy, and that wholly apart from the class aspects, she as a pregnant single woman, thwarted by the Texas criminal abortion laws, had standing to challenge those statutes. Indeed, we do not read the appellee's brief as really asserting anything to the contrary. The, quote, logical nexus between the status asserted and the claims sought to be adjudicated, end of quote, and the necessary degree of contentiousness are both present. The appellee notes, however, that the record does not disclose that Roe was pregnant at the time of the district court hearing on May 22, 1970, or on the following June 17, when the court's opinion and judgment were filed. And he suggests that Roe's case must now be moot because she and all other members of her class are no longer subject to any 1970 pregnancy. The usual rule in federal cases is that an actual controversy must exist at stages of appellate or certiorari review, and not simply at the date the action is initiated. But when, as here, pregnancy is a significant fact in the litigation, the normal 266-day human gestation period is so short that the pregnancy will come to term before the usual appellate process is complete. If that termination makes a case moot, Pregnancy litigation seldom will survive much beyond the trial stage, and appellate review will be effectively denied. Our law should not be that rigid. Pregnancy often comes more than once to the same woman, and in the general population, if man is to survive, it will always be with us. Pregnancy provides a classic justification for a conclusion of non-mootness. It truly could be, quote, capable of repetition, yet evading review, end of quote. We therefore agree with the district court that Jane Roe had standing to undertake this litigation, that she presented a justiciable controversy, and that the termination of her 1970 pregnancy has not rendered her case moot. B. Dr. Halford. The doctor's position is different. He entered Roe's litigation as a plaintiff intervener, alleging in his complaint that he, quote, in the past has been arrested for violating the Texas abortion laws and at the present time stands charged by indictment with violating said laws in the criminal district court of Dallas County, Texas, to wit, 1. The State of Texas v. James H. Halford, number C695307-1H, and 2. The State of Texas v. James H. Halford, number C692524H. In both cases, the defendant is charged with abortion. End of quote. In his application for leave to intervene, the doctor made like representations as to the abortion charges pending in the state court. These representations were also repeated in the affidavit he executed and filed in support of his motion for summary judgment. Dr. Halford is, therefore, in the position of seeking in a federal court declaratory and injunctive relief with respect to the same statutes under which he stands charged in criminal prosecutions simultaneously pending in state court. Although he stated that he has been arrested in the past for violating the state's abortion laws, he makes no allegation of any substantial and immediate threat to any federally protected right that cannot be asserted in his defense against the state prosecutions. Neither is there any allegation of harassment or bad faith prosecution. In order to escape the rule articulated in the cases cited in the next paragraph of this opinion, that absent harassment and bad faith, a defendant in a pending state criminal case cannot affirmatively challenge in federal court the statutes under which the state is prosecuting him, Dr. Halford seeks to distinguish his status as a present state defendant from his status as a, quote, potential future defendant, end of quote, and to assert only the latter for standing purposes here. We see no merit in that distinction. Our decision in Samuels v. Mackle compels the conclusion that the district court erred when it granted declaratory relief to Dr. Halford instead of refraining from so doing. The court, of course, was correct in refusing to grant injunctive relief to the doctor. 
The reasons supportive of that action, however, are those expressed in Samuels v. Mackle, Supra, and in Younger v. Harris, Boyle v. Landry, Perez v. Ledesma, and Byrne v. Carolais. See also Dombrowski v. Pfister. We note in passing that Younger and its companion cases were decided after the three-judge district court decision in this case. Dr. Halford's complaint in intervention, therefore, is to be dismissed. Footnote. We need not consider what different result, if any, would follow if Dr. Halford's intervention were on behalf of a class. His complaint in intervention does not purport to assert a class suit and makes no reference to any class apart from an allegation that he, quote, and others similarly situated, end of quote, must necessarily guess at the meaning of Article 1196. His application for leave to intervene goes somewhat further for it asserts that Plaintiff Rowe does not adequately protect the interest of the doctor, quote, and the class of people who are physicians, and the class of people who are patients, end of quote. The leave application, however, is not the complaint. Despite the district court's statement to the contrary, we fail to perceive the essentials of a class suit in the Halford complaint. End of footnote. He is remitted to his defenses in the state criminal proceedings against him. We reverse the judgment of the district court insofar as it granted Dr. Halford relief and failed to dismiss his complaint in intervention. C. The Doe's. In view of our ruling as to Rose standing in her case, the issue of the Doe's standing in their case has little significance. The claims they assert are essentially the same as those of Roe, and they attack the same statutes. Nevertheless, we briefly note the Doe's posture. Their pleadings present them as a childless married couple, the woman not being pregnant, who have no desire to have children at this time because of their having received medical advice that Mrs. Doe should avoid pregnancy, and for, quote, other highly personal reasons, end of quote. But they, quote, fear they may face the prospect of becoming parents, end of quote. And if pregnancy ensues, they, quote, would want to terminate, end of quote, it by an abortion. They assert an inability to obtain an abortion legally in Texas, and consequently, the prospect of obtaining an illegal abortion there, or of going outside Texas to some place where the procedure could be obtained legally and competently. We thus have as plaintiffs a married couple who have, as their asserted immediate and present injury, only an alleged, quote, detrimental effect upon their marital happiness, end of quote, because they are forced to, quote, the choice of refraining from normal sexual relations or of endangering Mary Doe's health through a possible pregnancy, end of quote. Their claim is that sometime in the future, Mrs. Doe might become pregnant because of possible failure of contraceptive measures, and at that time in the future, she might want an abortion that might then be illegal under the Texas statutes. The very phrasing of the Doe's position reveals its speculative character. Their alleged injury rests on possible future contraceptive failure, possible future pregnancy, possible future unpreparedness for parenthood, and possible future impairment of health. Any one or more of these several possibilities may not take place, and all may not combine. In the Doe's estimation, these possibilities might have some real or imagined impact upon their marital happiness but we are not prepared to say that the bare allegation of so indirect an injury is sufficient to present an actual case or controversy. The Doe's claim falls far short of those resolved otherwise in the cases that the Doe's urge upon us, namely Investment Company Institute v. Camp, Data Processing Service v. Camp, and Epperson v. Arkansas, see also Truax v. Rach. The Doe's, therefore, are not appropriate plaintiffs in this litigation. Their complaint was properly dismissed by the district court, and we affirm that dismissal. 5. The principal thrust of the appellant's attack on the Texas statutes is that they improperly invade a right said to be possessed by the pregnant woman to choose to terminate her pregnancy. Appellant would discover this right in the concept of personal liberty embodied in the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause or in personal, marital, familial, and sexual privacy said to be protected by the Bill of Rights or its penumbras, or among those rights reserved to the people by the Ninth Amendment. Before addressing this claim, we feel it desirable briefly to survey, in several aspects, the history of abortion, 
for such insight as that history may afford us, and then to examine the state purposes and interests behind the criminal abortion laws. 6. It perhaps is not generally appreciated that the restrictive criminal abortion laws in effect in a majority of states today are of relatively recent vintage. Those laws generally prescribing abortion or its attempt at any time during pregnancy except when necessary to preserve the pregnant woman's life are not of ancient or even of common law origin. Instead, they derive from statutory changes effected for the most part in the latter half of the 19th century. 1. Ancient Attitudes These are not capable of precise determination. We are told that at the time of the Persian Empire, abortifacients were known and that criminal abortions were severely punished. We are also told, however, that abortion was practiced in Greek times as well as in the Roman era, and that, quote, it was resorted to without scruple, end of quote. The Ephesian, Serranos, often described as the greatest of the ancient gynecologists, appears to have been generally opposed to Rome's prevailing free abortion practices. He found it necessary to think first of the life of the mother, and he resorted to abortion when upon this standard he felt the procedure advisable. Greek and Roman law afforded little protection to the unborn. If abortion was prosecuted in some places, it seems to have been based on a concept of a violation of the father's right to his offspring. Ancient religion did not bar abortion. 2. The Hippocratic Oath What, then, of the famous oath that has stood so long as the ethical guide of the medical profession, and that bears the name of the great Greek, 460 to 377 BC, who has been described as the father of medicine, the, quote, wisest and the greatest practitioner of his art, end of quote, and the, quote, most important and most complete medical personality of antiquity, end of quote, who dominated the medical schools of his time, and who typified the sum of the medical knowledge of the past. The oath varies somewhat according to the particular translation, but in any translation the content is clear. Quote, I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked, nor suggest any such counsel, and in like manner I will not give to a woman a pessary to produce abortion, end of quote, or, quote, I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody if asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. Similarly, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy, end of quote. Although the oath is not mentioned in any of the principal briefs in this case or in Dovey Bolton, it represents the apex of the development of strict ethical concepts in medicine, and its influence endures to this day. Why did not the authority of Hippocrates dissuade abortion practice in his time and that of Rome? The late Dr. Edelstein provides us with a theory. The oath was not uncontested even in Hippocrates' day. Only the Pythagorean school of philosophers frowned upon the related act of suicide. Most Greek thinkers, on the other hand, commended abortion, at least prior to viability. For the Pythagoreans, however, it was a matter of dogma. For them, the embryo was animate from the moment of conception, and abortion meant destruction of a living being. The abortion clause of the oath, therefore, quote, echoes Pythagorean doctrines, end of quote, and, quote, in no other stratum of Greek opinion were such views held or proposed in the same spirit of uncompromising austerity, end of quote. Dr. Edelstein then concludes that the oath originated in a group representing only a small segment of Greek opinion, and that it certainly was not accepted by all ancient physicians. He points out that medical writings down to Galen, A.D. 130 to 200, quote, give evidence of the violation of almost every one of its injunctions, end of quote. But with the end of antiquity, a decided change took place. Resistance against suicide and against abortion became common. The oath came to be popular. The emerging teachings of Christianity were in agreement with the Pythagorean ethic. The oath, quote, became the nucleus of all medical ethics, end of quote, and, quote, was applauded as the embodiment of truth, end of quote. Thus, suggests Dr. Edelstein, it is, quote, a Pythagorean manifesto, and not the expression of an absolute standard of medical conduct, end of quote. This, it seems to us, is a satisfactory and acceptable explanation of the Hippocratic Oath's apparent rigidity. It enables us to understand, in historical context, a long-accepted and revered statement of medical ethics. 3. The Common Law 
It is undisputed that at common law, abortion performed before, quote, quickening, end of quote, the first recognizable movement of the fetus in utero appearing usually from the 16th to the 18th week of pregnancy, was not an indictable offense. The absence of a common law crime for pre-quickening abortion appears to have developed from a confluence of earlier philosophical, theological, and civil and canon law concepts of when life begins. These disciplines variously approach the question in terms of the point at which the embryo or fetus became formed or recognizably human, or in terms of when a person came into being, that is, infused with a soul or animated. A loose consensus evolved in early English law that these events occurred at some point between conception and live birth. Footnote. Early philosophers believed that the embryo or fetus did not become formed and begin to live until at least 40 days after conception for a male and 80 to 90 days for a female. Aristotle's thinking derived from his three-stage theory of life, vegetable, animal, rational. The vegetable stage was reached at conception, the animal at, quote, animation, end of quote, and the rational soon after live birth. This theory, together with the 40 to 80 day view, came to be accepted by early Christian thinkers. The theological debate was reflected in the writings of St. Augustine, who made a distinction between embryo inanimatus, not yet endowed with a soul, and embryo animatus. He may have drawn upon Exodus chapter 21, verse 22. At one point, however, he expressed the view that human powers cannot determine the point during fetal development at which the critical change occurs. Galen, in three treatises related to embryology, accepted the thinking of Aristotle and his followers. Later, Augustine on abortion was incorporated by Gratian into the Decretum published about 1140. This Decretal and the Decretals that followed were recognized as the definitive body of canon law until the new code of 1917, end of footnote. This was, quote, immediate animation, end of quote. Although Christian theology and the canon law came to fix the point of animation at 40 days for a male and 80 days for a female, a view that persisted until the 19th century, there was otherwise little agreement about the precise time of formation or animation. There was agreement, however, that prior to this point, the fetus was to be regarded as part of the mother, and its destruction, therefore, was not homicide. Due to continued uncertainty about the precise time when animation occurred, to the lack of any empirical basis for the 40 to 80 day view, and perhaps to Aquinas' definition of movement as one of the two first principles of life, Bracton focused upon quickening as the critical point. The significance of quickening was echoed by later common law scholars and found its way into the received common law in this country. Whether abortion of a quick fetus was a felony at common law or even a lesser crime is still disputed. Bracton, writing early in the 13th century, thought it homicide. Footnote. Bracton took the position that abortion by blow or poison was homicide, quote, if the fetus be already formed and animated, and particularly if it be animated, end of quote. Or, as a later translation puts it, quote, if the fetus is already formed or quickened, especially if it is quickened, end of quote. End of footnote. But the later and predominant view, following the great common law scholars, has been that it was, at most, a lesser offense. In a frequently cited passage, Koch took the position that abortion of a woman, quote, quick with child, end of quote, is, quote, a great misprision and no murder, end of quote. Blackstone followed, saying that while abortion after quickening had once been considered manslaughter, though not murder, quote, modern law, end of quote, took a less severe view. A recent review of the common law precedents argues, however, that those precedents contradict Coke and that even post-quickening abortion was never established as a common law crime. Footnote. Means, the phoenix of abortional freedom is a penumbral or Ninth Amendment right about to arise from the 19th century legislative ashes of a 14th century common law liberty, the author examines the two principal precedents cited marginally by Koch, both contrary to his dictum, and traces the treatment of these and other cases by earlier commentators. He concludes that Koch, who himself participated as an advocate in an abortion case in 1601, 
may have intentionally misstated the law. The author even suggests a reason. Koch's strong feelings against abortion, coupled with his determination to assert common law, secular jurisdiction to assess penalties for an offense that traditionally had been an exclusively ecclesiastical or canon law crime. See also later who notes that some scholars doubt that the common law ever was applied to abortion, that the English ecclesiastical courts seem to have lost interest in the problem after 1527, and that the preamble to the English legislation of 1803, referred to in the text, states that, quote, no adequate means have been hitherto provided for the prevention and punishment of such offenses, end of quote, end of footnote. This is of some importance because, while most American courts ruled, in holding or dictum, that abortion of an unquickened fetus was not criminal under their received common law, others followed Coke in stating that abortion of a quick fetus was a, quote, misprision, end of quote, a term they translated to mean misdemeanor, that their reliance on Coke in this aspect of the law was uncritical, and, apparently in all the reported cases, dictum, due probably to the paucity of common law prosecutions for post-quickening abortion, makes it now appear doubtful that abortion was ever firmly established as a common law crime, even with respect to the destruction of a quick fetus. 4. The English Statutory Law England's first criminal abortion statute, Lord Ellenborough's Act, came in 1803. It made abortion of a quick fetus, Section 1, a capital crime, but in Section 2, it provided lesser penalties for the felony of abortion before quickening, and thus preserved the quickening distinction. This contrast was continued in the general revision of 1828. It disappeared, however, together with the death penalty in 1837, and did not reappear in the Offenses Against the Person Act of 1861 that formed the core of English anti-abortion law until the liberalizing reforms of 1967. In 1929, the Infant Life Preservation Act came into being. Its emphasis upon the destruction of, quote, the life of a child capable of being born alive, end of quote. It made a willful act performed with the necessary intent a felony. It contained a proviso that one was not to be found guilty of the offense, quote, unless it is proved that the act which caused the death of the child was not done in good faith for the purpose only of preserving the life of the mother, end of quote. A seemingly notable development in the English law was the case of Rex v. Bourne. This case apparently answered in the affirmative the question whether an abortion necessary to preserve the life of the pregnant woman was accepted from the criminal penalties of the 1861 Act. In his instructions to the jury, Judge McNaughton referred to the 1929 Act and observed that that act related to, quote, the case where a child is killed by a willful act at the time when it is being delivered in the ordinary course of nature, end of quote. He concluded that the 1861 Act's use of the word, quote, unlawfully, end of quote, imported the same meaning expressed by the specific proviso in the 1929 Act, even though there was no mention of preserving the mother's life in the 1861 Act. He then construed the phrase, quote, preserving the life of the mother, end of quote, broadly that is, quote, in a reasonable sense, end of quote, to include a serious and permanent threat to the mother's health, and instructed the jury to acquit Dr. Bourne if it found he had acted in a good faith belief that the abortion was necessary for this purpose. The jury did acquit. Recently, Parliament enacted a new abortion law. This is the Abortion Act of 1967. The Act permits a licensed physician to perform an abortion where two other licensed physicians agree a. Quote, that the continuance of the pregnancy would involve risk to the life of the pregnant woman or of injury to the physical or mental health of the pregnant woman or any existing children of her family greater than if the pregnancy were terminated. End of quote. Or b. Quote, that there is a substantial risk that if the child were born, it would suffer from such physical or mental abnormalities as to be seriously handicapped. End of quote. The Act also provides that in making this determination, quote, account may be taken of the pregnant woman's actual or reasonably foreseeable environment, end of quote. It also permits a physician, without the concurrence of others, to terminate a pregnancy where he is of the good faith opinion that the abortion, quote, is immediately necessary to save the life 
or to prevent grave permanent injury to the physical or mental health of the pregnant woman. End of quote. 5. The American Law In this country, the law in effect in all but a few states until the mid-19th century was the pre-existing English common law. Connecticut, the first state to enact abortion legislation, adopted in 1821 that part of Lord Ellenborough's Act that related to a woman, quote, quick with child, end of quote. The death penalty was not imposed. Abortion before quickening was made a crime in that state only in 1860. In 1828, New York enacted legislation that in two respects was to serve as a model for early anti-abortion statutes. First, while barring destruction of an unquickened fetus as well as a quick fetus, it made the former only a misdemeanor, but the latter second-degree manslaughter. Second, it incorporated a concept of therapeutic abortion by providing that an abortion was excused if it, quote, shall have been necessary to preserve the life of such mother or shall have been advised by two physicians to be necessary for such purpose, end of quote. By 1840, when Texas had received the common law, only eight American states had statutes dealing with abortion. It was not until after the war between the states that legislation began generally to replace the common law. Most of these initial statutes dealt severely with abortion after quickening, but were lenient with it before quickening. Most punished attempts equally with completed abortions. While many statutes included the exception for an abortion thought by one or more physicians to be necessary to save the mother's life, that provision soon disappeared and the typical law required that the procedure actually be necessary for that purpose. Gradually, in the middle and late 19th century, the quickening distinction disappeared from the statutory law of most states, and the degree of the offense and the penalties were increased. By the end of the 1950s, a large majority of the jurisdictions banned abortion, however and whenever performed, unless done to save or preserve the life of the mother. The exceptions, Alabama and the District of Columbia, permitted abortion to preserve the mother's health. Three states permitted abortions that were not, quote, unlawfully, end of quote, performed, or that were not, quote, without lawful justification, end of quote, leaving interpretation of those standards to the courts. In the past several years, however, a trend toward liberalization of abortion statutes has resulted in adoption by about one-third of the states of less stringent laws most of them patterned against the ALI Model Penal Code, Section 230.3, set forth as Appendix B to the opinion in Doe v. Bolton. Footnote. Fourteen states have adopted some form of the ALI statute. Mr. Justice Clark described some of these states as having, quote, led the way, end of quote. By the end of 1970, four other states had repealed criminal penalties for abortions performed in early pregnancy by a licensed physician subject to stated procedural and health requirements. The precise status of criminal abortion laws in some states is made unclear by recent decisions in state and federal courts striking down existing state laws in whole or in part. End of footnote. It is thus apparent that at common law, at the time of the adoption of our Constitution, and throughout the major portion of the 19th century, abortion was viewed with less disfavor than under most American statutes currently in effect. Phrasing it another way, a woman enjoyed a substantially broader right to terminate a pregnancy than she does in most states today. At least with respect to the early stage of pregnancy, and very possibly without such a limitation, the opportunity to make this choice was present in this country well into the 19th century. Even later, the law continued for some time to treat less punitively an abortion procured in early pregnancy. 6. The Position of the American Medical Association The anti-abortion mood prevalent in this country in the late 19th century was shared by the medical profession. Indeed, the attitude of the profession may have played a significant role in the enactment of stringent criminal abortion legislation during that period. An AMA Committee on Criminal Abortion was appointed in May 1857. It presented its report to the 12th Annual Meeting. That report observed that the committee had been appointed to investigate criminal abortion, quote, with a view to its general suppression, end of quote. It deplored abortion and its frequency, and it listed three causes of, quote, this general demoralization. 
The first of these causes is a widespread popular ignorance of the true character of the crime, a belief, even among mothers themselves, that the fetus is not alive till after the period of quickening. The second of the agents alluded to is the fact that the profession themselves are frequently supposed careless of fetal life. The third reason of the frightful extent of this crime is found in the grave defects of our laws, both common and statute, as regards the independent and actual existence of the child before birth as a living being. These errors, which are sufficient in most instances to prevent conviction, are based, and only based, upon mistaken and exploded medical dogmas. With strange inconsistency, the law fully acknowledges the fetus in utero and its inherent rights for civil purposes, while personally and as criminally affected, it fails to recognize it and to its life as yet denies all protection. End of quote. The committee then offered, and the association adopted, resolutions protesting, quote, against such unwarrantable destruction of human life, end of quote, calling upon state legislatures to revise their abortion laws and requesting the cooperation of state medical societies, quote, in pressing the subject, end of quote. In 1871, a long and vivid report was submitted by the Committee on Criminal Abortion. It ended with the observation, quote, we had to deal with human life. In a matter of less importance, we could entertain no compromise. An honest judge on the bench would call things by their proper names. We could do no less, end of quote. It proffered resolutions adopted by the association, recommending, among other things, that it, quote, be unlawful and unprofessional for any physician to induce abortion or premature labor without the concurrent opinion of at least one respectable consulting physician, and then always with a view to the safety of the child, if that be possible, end of quote and calling, quote, the attention of the clergy of all denominations to the perverted views of morality entertained by a large class of females, I and men also, on this important question, end of quote. Except for periodic condemnation of the criminal abortionist, no further formal AMA action took place until 1967. In that year, the Committee on Human Reproduction urged the adoption of a stated policy of opposition to induced abortion, except when there is, quote, documented medical evidence, end of quote, of a threat to the health or life of the mother, or that the child, quote, may be born with incapacitating physical deformity or mental deficiency, end of quote, or that a pregnancy, quote, resulting from legally established statutory or forcible rape or incest, may constitute a threat to the mental or physical health of the patient, end of quote. Two other physicians, quote, chosen because of their recognized professional competence have examined the patient and have concurred in writing, end of quote. And the procedure, quote, is performed in a hospital accredited by the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals, end of quote. The providing of medical information by physicians to state legislatures in their consideration of legislation regarding therapeutic abortion was, quote, to be considered consistent with the principles of ethics of the American Medical Association, end of quote. This recommendation was adopted by the House of Delegates. In 1970, after the introduction of a variety of proposed resolutions and of a report from its Board of Trustees, a reference committee noted, quote, polarization of the medical profession on this controversial issue, end of quote, division among those who had testified, a difference of opinion among AMA councils and committees, quote, the remarkable shift in testimony, end of quote, in six months, felt to be influenced, quote, by the rapid changes in state laws and by the judicial decisions which tend to make abortion more freely available, end of quote and a feeling, quote, that this trend will continue, end of quote. On June 25, 1970, the House of Delegates adopted preambles and most of the resolutions proposed by the Reference Committee. The preambles emphasized, quote, the best interests of the patient, sound clinical judgment, and informed patient consent, end of quote, in contrast to, quote, mere acquiescence to the patient's demand, end of quote. The resolutions asserted that abortion is a medical procedure that should be performed by a licensed physician in an accredited hospital only after consultation with two other physicians and in conformity with state law, 
and that no party to the procedure should be required to violate personally held moral principles. Footnote. Quote, Whereas abortion, like any other medical procedure, should not be performed when contrary to the best interests of the patient, since good medical practice requires due consideration for the patient's welfare, and not mere acquiescence to the patient's demand, and whereas the standards of sound clinical judgment, which together with informed patient consent, should be determinative according to the merits of each individual case, therefore be it resolved that abortion is a medical procedure and should be performed only by a duly licensed physician and surgeon in an accredited hospital, acting only after consultation with two other physicians chosen because of their professional competency and in conformance with standards of good medical practice and the Medical Practice Act of his state, and be it further resolved that no physician or other professional personnel shall be compelled to perform any act which violates his good medical judgment. Neither physician, hospital, nor hospital personnel shall be required to perform any act violative of personally held moral principles. In these circumstances, good medical practice requires only that the physician or other professional personnel withdraw from the case so long as the withdrawal is consistent with good medical practice. End of quote. Proceedings of the AMA House of Delegates, 220, June 1970. End of footnote. The AMA Judicial Council rendered a complimentary opinion. Footnote. The principles of medical ethics of the AMA do not prohibit a physician from performing an abortion that is performed in accordance with good medical practice and under circumstances that do not violate the laws of the community in which he practices. In the matter of abortions, as of any other medical procedure, the Judicial Council becomes involved whenever there is alleged violation of the principles of medical ethics, as established by the House of Delegates. End of footnote. 7. The Position of the American Public Health Association In October 1970, the Executive Board of the APHA adopted standards for abortion services. These were five in number. A. Rapid and simple abortion referral must be readily available through state and local public health departments, medical societies, or other nonprofit organizations. B. An important function of counseling should be to simplify and expedite the provision of abortion services. It should not delay the obtaining of these services. C. Psychiatric consultation should not be mandatory. As in the case of other specialized medical services, psychiatric consultation should be sought for definite indications and not on a routine basis. D. A wide range of individuals, from appropriately trained, sympathetic volunteers to highly skilled physicians, may qualify as abortion counselors. E. Contraception and or sterilization should be discussed with each abortion patient. Among factors pertinent to life and health risks associated with abortion were three that, quote, are recognized as important, end of quote. A, the skill of the physician, B, the environment in which the abortion is performed, and above all, C, the duration of pregnancy as determined by uterine size and confirmed by menstrual history. It was said that, quote, a well-equipped hospital, end of quote, offers more protection, quote, to cope with unforeseen difficulties than an office or clinic without such resources. The factor of gestational age is of overriding importance, end of quote. Thus, it was recommended that abortions in the second trimester and early abortions in the presence of existing medical complications be performed in hospitals as inpatient procedures. For pregnancies in the first trimester, abortion in the hospital with or without overnight stay, quote, is probably the safest practice, end of quote. An abortion in an extramural facility, however, is an acceptable alternative, quote, provided arrangements exist in advance to admit patients promptly if unforeseen complications develop, end of quote. Standards for an abortion facility were listed. It was said that at present abortions should be performed by physicians or osteopaths who are licensed to practice and who have, quote, adequate training, end of quote. Eight, the position of the American Bar Association. At its meeting in February 1972, the ABA House of Delegates approved, with 17 opposing votes, the Uniform Abortion Act that had been drafted and approved the preceding August by the Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws. We set forth the act in full in the margin. 
Footnote. Uniform Abortion Act. Section 1. Abortion defined when authorized. A. Abortion means the termination of human pregnancy with an intention other than to produce a live birth or to remove a dead fetus. B. An abortion may be performed in this state only if it is performed 1. By a physician licensed to practice medicine or osteopathy in this state or by a physician practicing medicine or osteopathy in the employ of the government of the United States or of this state and the abortion is performed in the physician's office or in a medical clinic or in a hospital approved by the Department of Health or operated by the United States, this state, or any department, agency, or political subdivision of either, or by a female upon herself with the advice of the physician, and two, within 20 weeks after the commencement of the pregnancy, or after 20 weeks only if the physician has reasonable cause to believe, one, that there is a substantial risk the continuance of the pregnancy would endanger the life of the mother, or would gravely impair the physical or mental health of the mother. Two, that the child would be born with grave physical or mental defect. Or three, that the pregnancy resulted from rape or incest or illicit intercourse with a girl under the age of 16 years. Section two, penalty. Any person who performs or procures an abortion other than authorized by this act is guilty of a felony and upon conviction thereof may be sentenced to pay a fine not exceeding $1,000 or to imprisonment in the state penitentiary not exceeding five years, or both. Section 3. Uniformity of Interpretation. This act shall be construed to effectuate its general purpose to make uniform the law with respect to the subject of this act among those states which enact it. Section 4. Short title. This act may be cited as the Uniform Abortion Act. Section 5. Severability. If any provision of this act or the application thereof to any person or circumstance is held invalid, the invalidity does not affect other provisions or applications of this act which can be given effect without the invalid provision or application, and to this end the provisions of this act are severable. Section 6. Repeal. The following acts and parts of acts are repealed. 1, 2, 3. Section 7. Time of taking effect. This act shall take effect blank. End of footnote. The opinion of the court conference has appended an enlightening prefatory note. Footnote. This act is based largely upon the New York Abortion Act following a review of the more recent laws on abortion in several states and upon recognition of a more liberal trend in laws on this subject. Recognition was given also to the several decisions in state and federal courts which show a further trend toward liberalization of abortion laws, especially during the first trimester of pregnancy. Recognizing that a number of problems appeared in New York, a shorter time period for, quote, unlimited, end of quote, abortions was advisable. The time period was bracketed to permit the various states to insert a figure more in keeping with the different conditions that might exist among the states. Likewise, the language limiting the place or places in which abortions may be performed was also bracketed to account for different conditions among the states. In addition, limitations on abortions after the initial, quote, unlimited, end of quote, period were placed in brackets, so that individual states may adopt all or any of these reasons, or place further restrictions upon abortions after the initial period. This act does not contain any provision relating to medical review committees or prohibitions against sanctions imposed upon medical personnel refusing to participate in abortions because of religious or other similar reasons, or the like. Such provisions, while related, do not directly pertain to when, where, or by whom abortions may be performed. However, the act is not drafted to exclude such a provision by a state wishing to enact the same. End of footnote. 7. Three reasons have been advanced to explain historically the enactment of criminal abortion laws in the 19th century and to justify their continued existence. It has been argued occasionally that these laws were the product of a Victorian social concern to discourage illicit sexual conduct. Texas, however, does not advance this justification in the present case, and it appears that no court or commentator has taken the argument seriously. The appellants and Amici contend, moreover, that this is not a proper state purpose at all and suggest that if it were, the Texas statutes are overbroad in protecting it, 
since the law fails to distinguish between married and unwed mothers. A second reason is concerned with abortion as a medical procedure. When most criminal abortion laws were first enacted, the procedure was a hazardous one for the woman. This was particularly true prior to the development of antisepsis. Antiseptic techniques, of course, were based on discoveries by Lister, Pasteur, and others first announced in 1867, but were not generally accepted and employed until about the turn of the century. Abortion mortality was high. Even after 1900, and perhaps until as late as the development of antibiotics in the 1940s, standard modern techniques such as dilation and curatage were not nearly so safe as they are today. Thus, it has been argued that a state's real concern in enacting a criminal abortion law was to protect the pregnant woman, that is, to restrain her from submitting to a procedure that placed her life in serious jeopardy. Modern medical techniques have altered this situation. Appellants and various amici refer to medical data indicating that abortion in early pregnancy, that is, prior to the end of the first trimester, although not without its risk, is now relatively safe. Mortality rates for women undergoing early abortions, where the procedure is legal, appear to be as low as or lower than the rates for normal childbirth. Consequently, any interest of the state in protecting the woman from an inherently hazardous procedure, except when it would be equally dangerous for her to forego it, has largely disappeared. Of course, important state interests in the areas of health and medical standards do remain. The state has a legitimate interest in seeing to it that abortion like any other medical procedure, is performed under circumstances that ensure maximum safety for the patient. This interest obviously extends at least to the performing physician and his staff, to the facilities involved, to the availability of aftercare, and to adequate provision for any complication or emergency that might arise. The prevalence of high mortality rates at illegal, quote, abortion mills, end of quote, strengthens rather than weakens the state's interest in regulating the conditions under which abortions are performed. Moreover, the risk to the woman increases as her pregnancy continues. Thus, the state retains a definite interest in protecting the woman's own health and safety when an abortion is proposed at a late stage of pregnancy. The third reason is the state's interest, some phrase it in terms of duty, in protecting prenatal life. Some of the argument for this justification rests on the theory that a new human life is present from the moment of conception. The state's interest and general obligation to protect life then extends, it is argued, to prenatal life. Only when the life of the pregnant mother herself is at stake, balanced against the life she carries within her, should the interest of the embryo or fetus not prevail. Logically, of course, a legitimate state interest in this area need not stand or fall on acceptance of the belief that life begins at conception or at some other point prior to live birth. In assessing the state's interest, recognition may be given to the less rigid claim that as long as at least potential life is involved, the state may assert interests beyond the protection of the pregnant woman alone. Parties challenging state abortion laws have sharply disputed in some courts the contention that a purpose of these laws, when enacted, was to protect prenatal life. Pointing to the absence of legislative history to support the contention, they claim that most state laws were designed solely to protect the woman. Because medical advances have lessened this concern, at least with respect to abortion in early pregnancy, they argue that with respect to such abortions, the laws can no longer be justified by any state interest. There is some scholarly support for this view of original purpose. The few state courts called upon to interpret their laws in the late 19th and early 20th centuries did focus on the state's interest in protecting the woman's health rather than in preserving the embryo and fetus. Proponents of this view point out that in many states, including Texas, by statute or judicial interpretation, the pregnant woman herself could not be prosecuted for self-abortion or for cooperating in an abortion performed upon her by another. They claim that adoption of the quickening distinction through received common law and state statutes tacitly recognizes the greater health hazards inherent in late abortion and impliedly repudiates the theory that life begins at conception. It is with these interests and the eight to be attached to them that this case is concerned. Eight, the Constitution does not explicitly mention any right of privacy. In a line of decisions, however, 
Going back perhaps as far as Union Pacific Railroad Company v. Botsford, the court has recognized that a right of personal privacy or a guarantee of certain areas or zones of privacy does exist under the Constitution. In varying contexts, the court or individual justices have, indeed, found at least the roots of that right in the First Amendment, in the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, in the penumbras of the Bill of Rights, in the Ninth Amendment, or in the concept of liberty guaranteed by the first section of the Fourteenth Amendment. These decisions make it clear that only personal rights that can be deemed, quote, fundamental, end of quote, or, quote, implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, end of quote, are included in this guarantee of personal privacy. They also make it clear that the right has some extension to activities relating to marriage, procreation, contraception, family relationships, and child-rearing and education. This right of privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty and restrictions upon state action, as we feel it is, or, as the District Court determined, in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. The detriment that the state would impose upon the pregnant woman by denying this choice altogether is apparent. Specific and direct harm medically diagnosable even in early pregnancy may be involved. Maternity, or additional offspring, may force upon the woman a distressful life and future. Psychological harm may be imminent. Mental and physical health may be taxed by child care. There is also the distress for all concerned associated with the unwanted child, and there is the problem of bringing a child into a family already unable, psychologically and otherwise, to care for it. In other cases, as in this one, the additional difficulties and continuing stigma of unwed motherhood may be involved. All these are factors the woman and her responsible physician necessarily will consider in consultation. On the basis of elements such as these, Appellant and Samamichi argue that the woman's right is absolute and that she is entitled to terminate her pregnancy at whatever time, in whatever way, and for whatever reason she alone chooses. With this, we do not agree. Appellant's arguments that Texas either has no valid interest at all in regulating the abortion decision, or no interest strong enough to support any limitation upon the woman's sole determination, are unpersuasive. The court's decisions recognizing a right of privacy also acknowledge that some state regulation in areas protected by that right is appropriate. As noted above, a state may properly assert important interests in safeguarding health, in maintaining medical standards, and in protecting potential life. At some point in pregnancy, these respective interests become sufficiently compelling to sustain regulation of the factors that govern the abortion decision. The privacy right involved, therefore, cannot be said to be absolute. In fact, it is not clear to us that the claim asserted by some amici that one has an unlimited right to do with one's body as one pleases bears a close relationship to the right of privacy previously articulated in the court's decisions. The court has refused to recognize an unlimited right of this kind in the past. We therefore conclude that the right of personal privacy includes the abortion decision, but that this right is not unqualified and must be considered against important state interests in regulation. We note that those federal and state courts that have recently considered abortion law challenges have reached the same conclusion. A majority, in addition to the district court in the present case, have held state laws unconstitutional, at least in part because of vagueness or because of overbreadth and abridgment of rights. Others have sustained state statutes. Although the results are divided, most of these courts have agreed that the right of privacy, however based, is broad enough to cover the abortion decision, that the right nonetheless is not absolute and is subject to some limitations, and that, at some point, the state interests as to protection of health, medical standards, and prenatal life become dominant. We agree with this approach. Where certain, quote, fundamental rights, end of quote, are involved, the court has held that regulation limiting these rights may be justified only by a, quote, compelling state interest, end of quote, and that legislative enactments must be narrowly drawn to express only the legitimate state interests at stake. In the recent abortion cases cited above, courts have recognized these principles. 
those striking down state laws have generally scrutinized the state's interests in protecting health and potential life, and have concluded that neither interest justified broad limitations on the reasons for which a physician and his pregnant patient might decide that she should have an abortion in the early stages of pregnancy. Courts sustaining state laws have held that the state's determinations to protect health or prenatal life are dominant and constitutionally justifiable. 9. The district court held that the appellee failed to meet his burden of demonstrating that the Texas statute's infringement upon Roe's rights was necessary to support a compelling state interest, and that although the appellee presented, quote, several compelling justifications for state presence in the area of abortions, end of quote, the statutes outstripped these justifications and swept, quote, far beyond any areas of compelling state interest, end of quote. Appellant and appellee both contest that holding. Appellant, as has been indicated, claims an absolute right that bars any state imposition of criminal penalties in the area. Appellee argues that the state's determination to recognize and protect prenatal life from and after conception constitutes a compelling state interest. As noted above, we do not agree fully with either formulation. A. The appellee and certain amici argue that the fetus is a, quote, person, end of quote, within the language and meaning of the 14th Amendment. In support of this, they outline at length and in detail the well-known facts of fetal development. If this suggestion of personhood is established, the appellant's case, of course, collapses, for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the amendment. The appellant conceded as much on re-argument. On the other hand, the appellee conceded on re-argument that no case could be cited that holds that a fetus is a person within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. The Constitution does not define person in so many words. Section 1 of the 14th Amendment contains three references to person. The first, in defining citizens, speaks of, quote, persons born or naturalized in the United States, end of quote. The word also appears both in the Due Process Clause and in the Equal Protection Clause. Person is used in other places in the Constitution, in the listing of qualifications for representatives and senators, in the Apportionment Clause, footnote, we are not aware that in the taking of any census under this clause a fetus has ever been counted, end of footnote, in the Migration and Importation Provision, in the Emolument Clause, in the Electors Provisions, in the provision outlining qualifications for the office of president, in the extradition provisions and the superseded fugitive slave clause, and in the 5th, 12th, and 22nd Amendments, as well as in sections 2 and 3 of the 14th Amendment. But in nearly all these instances, the use of the word is such that it has application only postnatally. None indicates with any assurance that it has any possible prenatal application. Footnote. When Texas urges that a fetus is entitled to 14th Amendment protection as a person, it faces a dilemma. Neither in Texas nor in any other state are all abortions prohibited. Despite broad prescription, an exception always exists. The exception contained in Article 1196 for an abortion procured or attempted by medical advice for the purpose of saving the life of the mother is typical. But if the fetus is a person, who is not to be deprived of life without due process of law, and if the mother's condition is the sole determinant, does not the Texas exception appear to be out of line with the amendment's command? There are other inconsistencies between 14th Amendment status and the typical abortion statute. It has already been pointed out that, in Texas, the woman is not a principal or an accomplice with respect to an abortion upon her. If the fetus is a person, why is the woman not a principal or an accomplice? Further, the penalty for criminal abortion specified by Article 1195 is significantly less than the maximum penalty for murder prescribed by Article 1257 of the Texas Penal Code. If the fetus is a person, may the penalties be different? End of footnote. All this, together with our observation supra, that throughout the major portion of the 19th century, prevailing legal abortion practices were far freer than they are today, persuades us that the word person as used in the 14th Amendment does not include the unborn. Footnote. CF, the Wisconsin Abortion Statute, defining, quote, unborn child, end of quote, 
to mean, quote, a human being from the time of conception until it is born alive, end of quote, and the New Connecticut statute, declaring it to be the public policy of the state and the legislative intent, quote, to protect and preserve human life from the moment of conception, end of quote. End of footnote. This is in accord with the results reached in those few cases where the issue has been squarely presented. Indeed, our decision in United States v. Village inferentially is to the same effect, for we there would not have indulged in statutory interpretation favorable to abortion in specified circumstances if the necessary consequence was the termination of life entitled to 14th Amendment protection. This conclusion, however, does not of itself fully answer the contentions raised by Texas, and we pass on to other considerations. B. The pregnant woman cannot be isolated in her privacy. She carries an embryo and later a fetus, if one accepts the medical definitions of the developing young in the human uterus. The situation, therefore, is inherently different from marital intimacy, or bedroom possession of obscene material, or marriage, or procreation, or education, with which Eisenstadt and Griswold, Stanley, Loving, Skinner, and Pierce and Meyer were respectively concerned. As we have intimated above, it is reasonable and appropriate for a state to decide that at some point in time another interest, that of health of the mother or that of potential human life, becomes significantly involved. The woman's privacy is no longer sole, and any right of privacy she possesses must be measured accordingly. Texas urges that apart from the 14th Amendment, life begins at conception and is present throughout pregnancy, and that therefore the state has a compelling interest in protecting that life from and after conception. We need not resolve the difficult question of when life begins. When those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus, the judiciary, at this point in the development of man's knowledge, is not in a position to speculate as to the answer. It should be sufficient to note briefly the wide divergence of thinking on this most sensitive and difficult question. There has always been strong support for the view that life does not begin until live birth. This was the belief of the Stoics. It appears to be the predominant, though not the unanimous, attitude of the Jewish faith. It may be taken to represent also the position of a large segment of the Protestant community insofar as that can be ascertained. Organized groups that have taken a formal position on the abortion issue have generally regarded abortion as a matter for the conscience of the individual and her family. As we have noted, the common law found greater significance in quickening. Physicians and their scientific colleagues have regarded that event with less interest and have tended to focus either upon conception upon live birth, or upon the interim point at which the fetus becomes, quote, viable, end of quote, that is, potentially able to live outside the mother's womb, albeit with artificial aid. Viability is usually placed at about seven months, 28 weeks, but may occur earlier, even at 24 weeks. The Aristotelian theory of, quote, immediate animation, end of quote, that held sway throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in Europe, continued to be official Roman Catholic dogma until the 19th century, despite opposition to this, quote, insolment, end of quote, theory from those in the church who would recognize the existence of life from the moment of conception. The latter is now, of course, the official belief of the Catholic Church. As one brief amicus discloses, this is a view strongly held by many non-Catholics as well, and by many physicians. Substantial problems for precise definition of this view are posed, however, by new embryological data that purport to indicate that conception is a process over time rather than an event, and by new medical techniques such as menstrual extraction, the morning after pill, implementation of embryos, artificial insemination, and even artificial wombs. In areas other than criminal abortion, the law has been reluctant to endorse any theory that life, as we recognize it, begins before live birth, or to accord legal rights to the unborn, except in narrowly defined situations, and except when the rights are contingent upon live birth. For example, the traditional rule of tort law denied recovery for prenatal injuries even though the child was born alive. That rule has been changed in almost every jurisdiction. In most states, recovery is said to be permitted only if the fetus was viable, or at least quick, when the injuries were sustained. 
though few courts have squarely so held. In a recent development, generally opposed by the commentators, some states permit the parents of a stillborn child to maintain an action for wrongful death because of prenatal injuries. Such an action, however, would appear to be one to vindicate the parent's interest and is thus consistent with the view that the fetus, at most, represents only the potentiality of life. Similarly, unborn children have been recognized as acquiring rights or interests by way of inheritance or other devolution of property, and have been represented by guardians ad litem. Perfection of the interests involved, again, has generally been contingent upon live birth. In short, the unborn have never been recognized in the law as persons in the whole sense. 10. In view of all this, we do not agree that by adopting one theory of life, Texas may override the rights of the pregnant woman that are at stake. We repeat, however, that the state does have an important and legitimate interest in preserving and protecting the health of the pregnant woman, whether she be a resident of the state or a non-resident who seeks medical consultation and treatment there, and that it has still another important and legitimate interest in protecting the potentiality of human life. These interests are separate and distinct. Each grows in substantiality as the woman approaches term, and at a point during pregnancy, each becomes, quote, compelling, end of quote. With respect to the state's important and legitimate interest in the health of the mother, the, quote, compelling, end of quote, point, in light of present medical knowledge, is at approximately the end of the first trimester. This is so because of the now established medical fact referred to above that until the end of the first trimester, mortality in abortion may be less than mortality in normal childbirth. It follows that, from and after this point, a state may regulate the abortion procedure to the extent that the regulation reasonably relates to the preservation and protection of maternal health. Examples of permissible state regulation in this area are requirements as to the qualifications of the person who is to perform the abortion, as to the licensure of that person, as to the facility in which the procedure is to be performed, that is, whether it must be a hospital or maybe a clinic or some other place of less than hospital status, as to the licensing of the facility and the like. This means, on the other hand, that for the period of pregnancy prior to this compelling point, the attending physician, in consultation with his patient, is free to determine, without regulation by the state, that in his medical judgment, the patient's pregnancy should be terminated. If that decision is reached, the judgment may be effectuated by an abortion free of interference by the state. With respect to the state's important and legitimate interest in potential life, the compelling point is at viability. This is so because the fetus then presumably has the capability of meaningful life outside the mother's womb. State regulation protective of fetal life after viability thus has both logical and biological justifications. If the state is interested in protecting fetal life after viability, it may go so far as to proscribe abortion during that period, except when it is necessary to preserve the life or health of the mother. Measured against these standards, Article 1196 of the Texas Penal Code, in restricting legal abortions to those, quote, procured or attempted by medical advice for the purpose of saving the life of the mother, end of quote, sweeps too broadly. The statute makes no distinction between abortions performed early in pregnancy and those performed later, and it limits to a single reason, saving the mother's life, the legal justification for the procedure. The statute, therefore, cannot survive the constitutional attack made upon it here. This conclusion makes it unnecessary for us to consider the additional challenge to the Texas statute asserted on grounds of vagueness. 11. To summarize and to repeat, 1. A state criminal abortion statute of the current Texas type that accepts from criminality only a life-saving procedure on behalf of the mother without regard to pregnancy stage and without recognition of the other interests involved, is violative of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. A. For the stage prior to approximately the end of the first trimester, the abortion decision and its effectuation must be left to the medical judgment of the pregnant woman's attending physician. B. For the stage subsequent to approximately the end of the first trimester, the state, in promoting its interest in the health of the mother, 
may, if it chooses, regulate the abortion procedure in ways that are reasonably related to maternal health. C. For the stage subsequent to viability, the state, in promoting its interest in the potentiality of human life, may, if it chooses, regulate and even proscribe abortion except where it is necessary in appropriate medical judgment for the preservation of the life or health of the mother. 2. The state may define the term physician as it has been employed in the preceding paragraphs of this Part 11 of this opinion to mean only a physician currently licensed by the state and may proscribe any abortion by a person who is not a physician as so defined. In Doe v. Bolton, procedural requirements contained in one of the modern abortion statutes are considered. That opinion and this one, of course, are to be read together. Footnote. Neither in this opinion nor in Doe v. Bolton do we discuss the father's rights, if any exist in the constitutional context, in the abortion decision. No paternal right has been asserted in either of the cases, and the Texas and Georgia statutes on their face take no cognizance of the father. We are aware that some statutes recognize the father under certain circumstances. North Carolina, for example, requires written permission for the abortion from the husband when the woman is a married minor, that is, when she is less than 18 years of age. If the woman is an unmarried minor, written permission from the parents is required. We need not now decide whether provisions of this kind are constitutional. End of footnote. This holding, we feel, is consistent with the relative weights of the respective interests involved, with the lessons and examples of medical and legal history, with the lenity of the common law, and with the demands of the profound problems of the present day. The decision leaves the state free to place increasing restrictions on abortion as the period of pregnancy lengthens, so long as those restrictions are tailored to the recognized state interests. The decision vindicates the right of the physician to administer medical treatment according to his professional judgment up to the points where important state interests provide compelling justifications for intervention. Up to those points, the abortion decision in all its aspects is inherently and primarily a medical decision, and basic responsibility for it must rest with the physician. If an individual practitioner abuses the privilege of exercising proper medical judgment, the usual remedies, judicial and intraprofessional, are available. 12. Our conclusion that Article 1196 is unconstitutional means, of course, that the Texas abortion statutes as a unit must fall. The exception of Article 1196 cannot be struck down separately, for then the state will be left with a statute prescribing all abortion procedures, no matter how medically urgent the case. Although the district court granted Appellant Roe declaratory relief, it stopped short of issuing an injunction against enforcement of the Texas statutes. The court has recognized that different considerations enter into a federal court's decision as to declaratory relief on the one hand and injunctive relief on the other. We are not dealing with a statute that on its face appears to abridge free expression, an area of particular concern under Dombrowski and refined in Younger v. Harris. We find it unnecessary to decide whether the district court erred in withholding injunctive relief, for we assume the Texas prosecutorial authorities will give full credence to this decision that the present criminal abortion statutes of that state are unconstitutional. The judgment of the district court as to intervener Halford is reversed, and Dr. Halford's complaint in intervention is dismissed. In all other respects, the judgment of the district court is affirmed costs are allowed to the appellee. It is so ordered. End of section 26. Recording by Colleen McMahon.